This week is Elder Sunday, so let's invite Elder Chan Cheng Lok to deliver God's message to us. Hello there. If you are listening in, warmest greetings from SSGC. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. Today is Elder Sunday, and that means I can choose to speak on a topic of my own choice. In this dark and dreary world filled with troubles, pain and suffering, disasters, calamities, economic collapse, financial losses, perils of every kind, and specifically in this present moment, the COVID pandemic has caused people to be fearful and anxious. After slightly more than a year into this pandemic, how have all of you been do coping? When the pandemic started and the MCO came into force, we were all advised to stay at home. And since then and now, I believe our fears and anxieties have somewhat eased. And many people are used to working from home now. For me, I am walking at home, W-O-K-K-I-N-G. My culinary skills and home economics have improved. At the outset of the MCO, I was led to read and meditate on Psalm 91, and it has become my favorite psalm. My family and I have been blessed by this portion of scripture. This psalm contains many blessings and promises on safety and security for God's children. Now let's turn to Psalm 91, and I shall read from the New King James Version. Okay, commence reading from verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He has delivered you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your sight, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread on the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent 
you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. And let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. May the Holy Spirit open our hearts and our minds and grant us understanding as we delve into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have entitled my talk as the shadow of the Almighty, or rather, abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It sounds mysterious, but I shall unpack this psalm and pray that the Holy Spirit will give us some understanding. So have your Bibles open on Psalm 91 so that you can refer to it throughout my sermon. I will not be having any PowerPoint slides. The author of Psalm 91 is unknown and there is no title given to it. Some say it is written by Moses, while others say it's David's. I would not venture to take a position, but as a fact, let it remain anonymous. This psalm is one of the greatest possessions of the saints. This, was, this is quoted by Campbell Morgan. In the whole collection, there is not a more cheering psalm. Its tone is elevated and sustained throughout. Faith at its best and speaks nobly. And this is what Charles Spurgeon quoted. And I have divided my talks into three parts. The first one is, what is the secret place and the shadow of the Almighty? And then we'll look at the conditions to be met by believers. And the third one is the promises of safety and security. And so let me take you to verse 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I will trust. And when you unpack uh, the first two verses of the psalm, you see the four names of God being mentioned in Hebrew. The Most High in Hebrew is El Elyon. It means God the Highest, the Supreme One, the Preeminent, the Majestic and Sovereign God. And then, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And the Almighty here in Hebrew, it means El Shaddai, the Omnipotent and Overpowerer. And then, it says here, Another phrase, I will say of the Lord. And the Lord here in Hebrew is Yahweh. It's the personal name of God as revealed to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 6. And then the last phrase, my God, in him I will trust. And my God is in Hebrew, God in Hebrew is El Elohim, the creator God, as found in Genesis 
chapter 1, verse 1. And it is so comforting to know that the almighty, omnipotent, sovereign, and creator God is in control at any time, and as well as in this current pandemic situation. So let's look at what is the secret place of the Most High? Well, there is no GPS coordinates or WhatsApp location available to get to the secret place. I have read a few interpretations on the secret place. Suffice to say that when you look at verse 9, it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. So it is clear that the secret place is the Most High Himself. In other words, God Himself is the dwelling place and the secret place. The unbeliever and the world cannot enter in the secret place. They do not have access to God. Only believers have access to God through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no one, no man comes to the Father except through Him. Now, there are two key words in verse 1, namely, to dwell and to abide. And both speaks of a continuing position in God and, and, and a continuous relationship with God. Not someone who runs to God only as and when there is danger. To dwell and abide speaks of a permanent stay or residence. It is always a two-way relationship. He abides in God and God abides in him. In one of our UK trips, well, you know, in one of our trips to the UK, and at the emigration counter, the officer asked us, how long are you abiding? So abiding here means staying. The officer is actually asking, how long are you staying? Hence, if you come to God as and when you need Him and run to Him, only when you have urgent things to tell Him, then you cannot say that you are dwelling and abiding in God. It is important to understand what it means to be abiding in God and in Christ. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 38 and 39, two of the disciples who encountered Jesus asked him, where are you staying? The word staying is the same word as as a bike, as used in John chapter 15, where Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. Now, three thoughts interwoven together. That is, connection, dependence, and continuance. We need to be connected with Jesus, to depend on Jesus, and to continue with Jesus. And that is what it means to abide in Jesus. And without Jesus, we can do nothing. And, and I'll look, now look at this word shadow. And it is mentioned here and elsewhere in the Bible, always as a metaphor, and it refers to covering or protection. In Isaiah 51, verse 16, it reads, Covered you with the shadow of my hand. And shadow gives relief from the scorching heat of the sun, as if you were under a shade. And Psalm 
1 to 1, verse 6 tells us that the Lord is our shade and the sun will not strike you by day. Now, in verse 2, it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Now, if you are in the secret place of the Most High, you will have formed an intimate relationship with God the Father. You know God and He knows you. What the Sami sees as a general truth has turned into his personal experiential faith to the extent that he could exclaim confidently, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And in our unrestrained communion with the Lord, we should likewise be personal with God. Now, the psalmist also exclaimed, My God in whom I trust. Yes, trust in God. God requires you to place your faith and full trust in Him. If you do not trust God, then there is no relationship with Him at all. Verbal declaration and confession of the Word of God are important as salvation is made effective by our own confession. Like in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be safe. To be a Christian, one needs to make that confession with his own mouth. It is so simple and profound. So to recap what I've said so far, I have identified that, that two things, namely abiding in God, faith and trust in God, as conditions to be met. And the third condition is found in verse 14 of Psalm 91. And if you would refer to it, it reads, Because he has set his love upon me. And then the other uh, part of that verse, Because he has known my name. Now, both the Old Testament and the New Testament command that we love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. When we intend to obey His command, we normally falter and fail. It is a learning process for everyone. And God brings us through thick and thin in rough circumstances in life's journey, in many other times, in order to transform our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. Now, you and I have to choose to fully surrender our will and yield our bodies to Christ as living sacrifices. And then we begin to set our heart our soul and our mind to love the Lord. Our love for God must grow in intensity for the Lord and, experience, and we shall experience His transforming power to make us in the likeness of Christ. Apostle Paul said that the love of Christ completely Pels me. Indeed, God commanded His love toward us while we were yet sinners. He died for us. As God's covenant love is demonstrated to us in a tangible manner, likewise, He desires 
and expect us to reciprocate his love to by us loving him in return. This is a choice made by an act of will and not determined by your own feelings. The psalmist not only loves the Lord, but he knows his name. And the Bible tells us that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. To know his name means to know God's character and attributes like his holiness and his righteousness. Right, now taking you to my second point, or rather the third point, and that is the blessings and safety and security. Now, why this psalm is a favorite of many is because it unfolds promises of safety and security that no one can offer. If you are fearful of any danger, be it the COVID virus, you will find assurance, comfort, and confidence in the Lord at no cost. Let's look at verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. A fowler is one who hunts wild birds and traps them. And he works in secret and he changes his methods of entrapment. Satan is pictured as a fowler who entraps and you and I are like care-free birds. And because God is our refuge and fortress, He can save us from our enemies and from this perilous pestilence. And pestilence means diseases and plagues that kill their victims, such as the COVID-19 virus. The psalmist says, God can save him from these things. And when, when he makes God his refuge and fortress. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. And the psalmist alludes to the mother hen, sheltering her cheeks, providing comfort and safety. That God, the Lord's truth and faithfulness are like a shield and buckler. And both these armors, one big and one small, render us double protection. Now, Verses 5 and 6. You shall not be afraid of the terror, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. For God's children to be in a state of fear and despair during this COVID-19 pandemic, is needlessly unnecessary. You shall not be afraid because God, who is our refuge, gives strength and courage to his children. When God's children are gripped with fear, it shows they lack proper trust in God as protector, comforter, defender, and deliverer. Perils of various kind could come in any form. It could be terror or by arrow, as a pestilence, as a destruction, and at any time of the day, night, 
noon time? Yes, any time of the day. And it comes insidiously and without detection of the human eye. But the psalmist says, God is able to defend and deliver his children 24-7. Let me go on to verses 7 and 8. A thousand may fall at your sight and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Danger can be so close to you and you can be outnumbered in a ratio of one to 10,000. Nonetheless, God will specifically protect you. In contrast, God will let you see with your own eyes the reward of the wicked when his judgment falls on them. Now verse 9 and 10, Because you have made the Lord who is your refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, and no, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. And this is a repetition, a reinforcement of verses 5 and 8 of the promise, promises that, that we have covered just now. Shall so skip that. And then I go to verses 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The psalmist is aware that God has commanded his angel to prevent our feet from hitting against a stone from dashing against a stone. And how does he do that? He lifts us up. He bears us up. Indeed, we shall be plucked out of danger. Let me share you a recent incident about two months ago before Chinese New Year. I was on a leather cleaning the wall in my backyard with a turbo, turbo water jet. Suddenly, the leather gave way and I fell from some 10 feet high. I landed on my right knee. Praise the Lord. I sustained no injury at all. And I believe the angel of the Lord carried me and cushioned my fall my wife and a Christian brother who was helping me witness this terrifying fall. I cannot thank God enough for protecting me in times of danger like this. Glory to his name. Now, if you, in these two verses, it is, Interesting to note that Satan quoted in these two verses, verses 11 and 12, in Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And it's recorded in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 as well. And Satan challenged Jesus to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple mount. And Satan quoted the promise of protection to entice Jesus to take up the challenge. Did Jesus yield or take up the challenge? No. But Jesus replied to the devil. He said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And if you look carefully, Satan cleverly twisted the word of God by living out a phrase 
or words. And that is to keep you in all your ways. And these words were left out. Now, Satan intentionally left out those words because he wanted Jesus to do, to do things in his own way and not God's way. You see, the devil knows the word of God, but he deceptively twisted to mislead Jesus. And we also read in a few verse, verses in Matthew 4, after, after the, uh, the temptation, that the angels were there to help Jesus in his temptation and not in the way the devil suggested. Now, verse 13, it says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. And this is not a case of accidentally stepping on the snake as you were walking or tracking in the jungle. As a matter of fact, you shall intentionally trample them underfoot like a conqueror and declare your dominion and control over them. In Luke chapter 10 verse 19, when Jesus gave the promise to his disciples that they should do great exploits, he said, you shall tread upon serpents. That is, you shall have no, you shall have power. You shall have power to overcome whatsoever that may hinder you by the devil. And Apostle Paul assures us, all believers in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, that God shall tread down Satan under your feet shortly. And when we battle against Satan and his cohorts, we are fighting from the position of victory. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The devil was defeated at the cross of Christ. Now, let's proceed to verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me. Yeah. Yes, I covered much of that earlier. If you love the Lord, you can realize the seven promises. And it says, and, and this is normally called the seven I wills. And you look at it from verse 14 to verse 16. And the first I will is, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. And then he shall call me and I will answer him. And then the fourth I will, I will be with him in trouble. And the fifth one, I will deliver him. And the sixth one, I will honor him. And the seventh one, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And this promises and blessings can be ours if we know the Lord, our God. And this is a wonderful sum. It is solid, beautiful, powerful, intense, profound, timeless, comforting, and ornamentally crafted. 
So friends, during this COVID pandemic, you may face many challenges and trials and uncertainties. You may be facing financial and health problems, and this may have affected you badly, adversely. Fears and doubts may grip you or paralyze you. You may be in a state of despair. And because you do not know the future. The worst may come and how shall we all cope? Now, I want to tell you that there is hope in Jesus Christ. If you do not know Jesus and you would like to receive him as your Lord and Savior, you can follow this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for me and he arose on the third day. And I want to invite Jesus into my life right now. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for all my sins. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you have said this prayer from your heart, tell a friend of yours. The Bible says, to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Yes, this is the promise in the Bible. You have said this prayer sincerely from your heart. You are a child of God now. Let us close in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father and our gracious God, we are so grateful of the many precious blessings and promises from your word that we can appropriate and realize. We acknowledge that we need you, Abba Father. We need you evermore during this pandemic. You are our Lord and God. Grant, O oh Lord, your mercies to us and protect us and our loved ones from any harm and danger of every kind. As our good shepherd, may you shield and guide us and provide us for our every need. And now let me give you the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom peace. And all God's people say, Amen. Thank you, Elder Chan Ching Lok, for the message uh, for us today. And if you are new, or have a prayer request or a testimony that you would like to share with us, we would love to hear it from you. So please visit the website in the link in the description below so that we can get to know you better. Now let us close in prayer. Father Lord in heaven, we thank you for the message that you have given us today and lead us as we learn to live our life to worship you. May you continue to guide us as we uh, live with your Holy Spirit and with your strength and power rather than our strength and power, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.